Perfect. Great. So um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for um, the Polycon UK webinar. Today, we have Gerard Padro, who is going to present the rise and fall of local elections in China, which is joint work with um, Monica Martinez Bravo, who we had last week, Nancy Chen, and Yang Yao. Uh, before I hand over to Gerard, let me just remind you that these webinars take place every two weeks at Mondays 3 p.m. at UK time. In two weeks, we are going to have Pamela Campa from Site Stockholm. As usual, you can find more information on um, the, the future speakers and past web, webinars on our website. You can also follow us on Twitter and watch past talks on our YouTube channel. Uh, the format of the seminar is as follows. We're going to have uh, a 15 minute presentation uh, followed by a 10 minutes uh, for questions and discussion. Uh, we request that all attendees keep your microphones muted and cameras turned off. If you have a question, you can write it in the chat and we are going to be asking clarifying questions uh, as we go along. Um, more, you know, more deep questions that require a little bit more discussion are going to be postponed to the Q&A at the end. Now, after the Q&A at the top of the hour, we will finish the official part of the seminar and we will stop the recording. But uh, if you have additional questions, you're all welcome to stay and chat informally. So uh, Gerard, thanks you, thank you for accepting our invitation. The screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Ariana, and thank you for um, inviting me to do this. This is um, so. I, I apologize. Some of you may have seen, for sure, previous versions of this. This has been a project that's been around for a long time. I'm hoping this is the last version that I, that I have to do. There, and the reason I'm happy to present it again is because you know, because of some editors' um, uh, revisions, we actually went back and collected more data to be able to say something intelligent about the path of the fall. So we had a lot of info about the rise. Now we can actually say things about the fall, basically the last decade and a half of, of this process. So without further ado, or I should just say, I also, I will apologize in advice if there's some unscheduled guest appearance of my kids who today for a bunch of reasons that we better not enter actually happen to be home. But uh, besides that, hopefully my wife is keeping, is keeping the fort under control downstairs. Okay, so again, this vision work with, uh, with Monica, Nancy and, uh, and Yang Yao. Um, and again, we've been working at this for about a decade, actually more than a decade now. So it's been a long time. So let me let me get started. Huh? Let me see if I can get this thing started. I can. Okay. So what's the motivation here? Let me. So so uh, you you may know that basically there's there's a long tradition of study of of um, of the fact that uh, many autocracies actually have have been running elections um, as part of of the way the institutions work in those autocracies, but specifically. There's actually several autocracies that have introduced elections at the local level. So this is like at the very, very local uh, kind of municipality level, if you want, um, in several of these countries. And here I have a bunch of examples. And in some of these, um, some of these regimes, actually, eventually they introduce them at some point and then eventually backtrack and recentralize, right? And I have two examples here in China, in China and Vietnam, we could talk about other examples. So basically part of, you know, after again a decade of working on this, you know, the, the questions that we had were basically you know, what's the use for autocrats of local elections? Um, and, and therefore, you know, when this use runs, runs out, you know, why would they backtrack on these reforms? But it seems to us that, of course, the third question, which is what are the effects of introducing local elections is what's important to then figure out the answer to the other two questions. Um, so, as I said, there's a rich existing literature, mostly political science on why, um, on why autocrats would have elections. Um, and um, let me not spend too much time here because today I only have 50 minutes to go through this, but just I think a fair, a fair um, summary of the literature here is that basically these elections are, some, are useful in some way or another for elite politics in, in, the, in these autocracies, right? So they might be useful to figure out who are popular and other politicians that you want to co-opt into the regime or that you want to maybe uh, particularly repress or it might be good information to know how to share power among the different uh, members of the elite, right? But of course, you know, none of these theories are very useful to think about um, this local election in China, which were at the very, very local level, because, you know, certainly, you know, peasants in China who were the people voting in these elections are certainly not members of the elite. And frankly, I, I mean, none of, in, in this period of about 30 years, they have never been a credible overthrow threat for the regime. Oh, I've been muted. Am I muted or not? I'm unmuted. Sorry, it was my mistake. I was trying to admit somebody from the chat. 
No problem. So, so basically, just again, very quick, the existing theories that we have for, auto for autocracies running elections don't really work very well when you think about this very, very local level, right? So that's basically what we're trying to think about here. Um, however, when you actually read some of these working political science, there's like the embryo of an alternative theory, right, that they never fully develop, which is that is basically, you can think of these elections as ways of improving the local, the performance of this local level official at the municipality level that is actually they're doing stuff, right? Um, so when we are thinking about these papers that we kind of developed this idea, and out of thinking about this, we, we, uh, we come up with a novel trade-off to think about this type of local elections from the point of view of the autocrat. And then this trade-off is gonna give us predictions about what the effect should be of local elections for local governance, and also predictions about in, under what circumstances then these local elections are useful for the autocrat and under which circumstances he'd rather take them away. Okay, so that's gonna be uh, what I'm gonna to try to run through. So in a way, um, one thing that I like about this paper personally is that we move a bit the focus that's been mostly in economics. Most of the political economy of autocracy, if you're familiar with this, basically has um, models and autocrat that is mostly concerned with basically political survival and with rent seeking. Right. But the truth is that, you know, when you go, you know, when you think about the historical experience of autocracy or even today, typically autocrats come into government also with some agenda for the country, right? The, the Chinese communists certainly had an agenda for the country. There's things they wanted to do. You know, you, Hugo Chavez had an, agenda, had an agenda for Venezuela and, and Fidel Castro had an agenda for Cuba, right? So, so, so many of these autocrats, and even Pinochet had an, had an agenda for Chile, right? So many, many autocrats actually, are not only there just to steal money and, and survive in power, they actually want to get things done in the country. And that means that they're facing basically a classic organizational problem of having the bureaucracy of the state perform in some direction, right? When you want to implement any policy, you need the state to work at least up to some level, right? So that's in a way the way we think about this, right? So that's, let me put here what I, what I call the organizational problem. Incidentally, the original paper had a model in it you know, the editor said, we don't need the model, so now there's no model anymore, right? So I'm just gonna say it verbally. Actually, I agree with the editor in this case. Yeah. So again, I want you to think about an autocrat that wants to implement some policies in the country, right? But of course, these policies, as we discussed, are actually carried out by local officials, you know, so there's several levels down the bureaucracy. And as usual, with an organization, then you're gonna have problems of moral hazard and maybe adverse selection, basically the typical organizational problems that, in, that, in, that you have in any uh, public or private organization where the orders come from the top, but the guys at the bottom might be doing something different. Right? Um, and of course, so, so painting with a very broad brush, there are two solutions to this organizational problem from the point of view of the autocrat. One of the solutions is a traditional one. You could basically improve much better the vertical bureaucratic system, including the system of collecting information and figuring out what these guys are doing, to ameliorate the problem of moral hazard and adverse selection just out of sheer, basically, investment and, figure, you know, just collect investment for them, right? But the alternative in this kind of world would be to introduce local elections so that the local bureaucrats now are actually accountable to below, okay? Um, so in a way, you know, solution one is strengthen vertical accountability from top to bottom, but solution two is actually introducing another vector of accountability, which is from the bottom to these, to these um, local bureaucrats, right? And we're gonna try, I'm gonna try to convince you that basically it's, it's because of reason two that these guys thought at some point the local elections were useful to them, okay? Um, so basically solution one might be better for the bureaucrat, but the problem is that, you know, it takes money and it takes time to build, to improve bureaucratic performance, right? While solution two in reality is actually cheap in terms of, um, in terms of money. Right. Now, so this seems this seems great, except of course, if that was all that was going on, then everybody would introduce local elections because you know I haven't I haven't shown you any downside of it, right? So what's the downside of it? Well, actually, let me go first through the upside. The upside should be obvious, right? I effectively delegate monitoring of this guy to these local people, the villagers, right? The villagers know who these local guys are, who these local officials are. They know what they are doing. So presumably the problems of adverse selection and moral hazard are much more ameliorated just because they have much better control of information than you have sitting, you know, 17 levels up in Beijing, right? 
However, the problem, of course, is that the citizens might have different incentives than you have. In particular, you, you know, the citizen might have a different idea of what's a good performance of this guy compared to what you think is sitting in Beijing, right? So where does this tension come to the fore? Well, this tension comes to the fore when you in Beijing are telling the local official to do something that is actually unpopular among the citizens, right? For the things that are popular, in fact, you and the citizens are aligned. So the citizens are going to give incentives to this guy to be less corrupt and to work harder and all these things, right? But for things that are unpopular, like for instance, the one child policy, this, the introducing local elections is not going to help you as an autocrat, right? In fact, it might even make things worse, right? Because now you're making the local official accountable to citizens that absolutely hate things like the one child policy, right? So this is basically going to be the, the trade-off that we're going to explode here in terms of things, right? So when you introduce local elections, you would expect incentives for the local official to become stronger and better aligned for popular policies, but in fact to weaken for unpopular policies. Okay. When you think about uh, in, when you think about this in terms of models, you can basically go back to the goal to the old discussion of delegation in Agion Tiro, in which basically the problem here is basically a similar one, right? Because you have limited information as a principle, delegation will always cause authority problems. Um, so what's the okay? So what's the bottom line of this trade-off? The bottom line is that it is actually a big cost for the autocrat to order things from the top to know that they're not going to be following the bottom because these things are unpopular, right? Which means that actually you are going to be happy to endure these costs if your bureaucratic capacity is so low that the vertical system gives very weak incentives to these guys. But as soon as you can strengthen the vertical system of control, actually, we'll probably be happy to take elections away to control the system, you know, to basically use a top down authority, right? So basically, you can see here how this is going to work for us in terms of thinking about these elections in China, right? I'm going to try to convince you that in the early 80s, the Chinese state is actually in a fairly poor, uh, in, a, in fairly poor, both budgetary and, and, um, and bureaucratically. So at that point, it made sense to introduce local elections, right? But of course, after 20 years of spectacular growth by the mid 2000s, you know, the, when the amount of investment in the bureaucracy will be will have been so strong that they're happy to take elections away. Although what they're going to do is going to be weaken elections and start doing things a little more in the old system of you know command and control from the top. Okay, so that this is the narrative I'm going to try to convince you in the next in the next uh, half hour. Okay. So what I like about this is that it's in a way it's it's a, it's a single variable in this case bureaucratic capacity, right? That's going to give us a very parsimonious view about why they introduced this in the eighties and when they took it away starting in the mid two thousands, right? Which is um, which I find find I like it. Okay. Um, okay. So how are we, so this uh, this story that I just told you that hopefully is clear. The question is, how am I going to go about trying to substantiate it in the data, right? So here are basically um, the five, you know, patterns I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to convince you that they are in the data that are basically aligned with the story that we're telling, right? So the first thing is that um, if we are right, and elections were introduced for this particular reason um, of, uh, of improving, of improving, um, uh, governance at the local level, it has to be the case that these elected leaders actually are able to do things. They actually have some power at the local level. And as I'll show you, this is not obvious example for two reasons. One is one alternative story would have been that the elections were complete as a sideshow when these guys were never, there was just giving elections to have the people happy, but in reality, they were never willing to give these guys any power, right? So that's reason number one. And reason number two, that it's related to the first reason is that Remember, this is China, so everywhere you have executive authorities, but also the party cells, the communist party cells in parallel, right? It's never clear who has the real power, right? The party cells and the party secretary will not be affected by elections. So therefore, there's an extra reason to expect that maybe introduce elections. This doesn't change anything because the power both before and after was in the party secretary, who was not elected. Right, so that's our, so. Point number one is actually it seems trivial, but it's actually not as trivial given the context. Right, then I'm going to try to convince you that actually elections on policies have the effect that we would expect given our proto theory. Right, in particular, 
popular policies will get will look better after elections are introduced, but unpopular policies will weaken. The implementation of unpopular policies will weaken. And then I will try to show you that when I look at the re-election patterns of these local officials are actually consistent with performance, with having good performance in popular policies and weakening in unpopular policies, right? So elections will work in the way that we expect, right? So people that get re-elected are gonna be those that are doing more in terms of popular policies and less in terms of unpopular policies. And then finally, and that's point five, which is basically all the new data is actually about point five. I'm gonna to try to convince you that in fact, increases in bureaucratic capacity will come hand in hand with weakening the autonomy of these elected units, right? So this is gonna be basically about the, about the fall of elections is basically on point five, okay? As bureaucratic capacity will go up, you will see um, um, the, the ability of these local elected leaders of the things is gonna be shrinking. Okay. Or more specific, sorry, Francesco? Uh, um, there's, a, there's a question actually, I just saw a second one coming up. Um, this actually, um, presumably you can measure the popularity or unpopularity of different measures uh, here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and presumably you can do that over time. So uh, bureaucratic capacity could change over time. And this is the question from Orkun's uh, Saka. Uh, the suggestion is, but also uh, uh, popularity of measures can change over time, right? So, that is you true. Just, so are you going to talk about that or not? So, unfortunately, I will not, in the sense that I don't have. So, so. I mean, I, I maybe I can talk about this for a second, even right now. So, for the value. So, uh, let's talk about why I think it's the biggest, more clear and popular policy that we're going to be talking about, which is the one child policy. Okay, so the one child policy um, has and will always be extremely unpopular among the people. But if anything, it works against our story in the sense that um, clearly the importance of this policy for Beijing has been weakening over time. They really wanted this thing to be implemented in the 80s and the 90s. By the time the 2000s come, actually, they start caring less. And frankly, they took it off the books about you know five or six years ago. Okay. So, which means that if, if, um, if you follow our logic, in fact, taking away what the importance of one unpopular policy should actually make you double down in giving autonomy to the local guys, right? It's one less thing that you need to care about, right? And yet what I'm gonna show you is that it goes the other way. Okay, that from the mid 2000s, in fact, they're actually constraining the authority of these guys and taking autonomy away from these people, right? Um, the explanation, I think, is because there's other wedge, you know, um, unpopular things that are coming in that they basically want to, to um, they want to retrench control anyway, even though the specific things that we can measure are actually losing in importance. Um, I think that's part of the issue of having, you know, kind of 30 years of data here that things change in importance, and we don't have direct measures at every point about how much both the cities. So basically, bottom line, very good question posed by the audience. Um, it, and I would say it's even more complex because it's not only about what the people care about, but also about what Beijing cares about. And both these things are basically moving over those 30 years. And I'm going to have to, uh, the argument, They would, if I could measure them, they should certainly be part of the argument. Unfortunately, I cannot measure this degree of unpopularity. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to continue as if this thing had remained constant. Let me put it like this, which we know is not the case. But, uh, also, there's a second question, um, which I'm not sure how much you can deal with because you're talking about a single country here, but does the quality of elections matter? So if there's things like uh, vote buying uh, and so on. Um, so, so actually, I'm sure it does matter. We, we, we did something about it. It was hard to get the interaction. So it matters. I'm sure it matters. I'm sure it matters also within China because there's huge heterogeneity about how well these elections were being run, by the way. Um, we are not going to be able to do anything systematic about this for two reasons. One is that I'm not sure that we have enough of a sample size for the heterogeneity to actually come up and, and be able to say something. But the second I think is more important is that, of course, the quality of these elections is fully endogenous. So I'm not so so you know when I'm running when we run the interactions of what I'm going to show you with some measures we have of quality of elections and we don't get much, you know for all I know it's because everything is endogenous and you know that 
you sort of, if you know, you may, you may lose, you might run a worse quality election. And that's why, you know, on the aggregate, everything looks flat, right? So for my very interesting question, I'd love to be able to tell you something about that. I don't think I can with this data. Um, Thank you. That's it. Okay, so let me continue again. So I'm going to give you as fast as I can some quick background on this, because if you are like me about 10 years, 15 years ago, I didn't even know that there were elections in China. So that's it. Um, and then quickly I'll go through the data and the empirical strategies and the results, and hopefully I can get to some discussion in the half an hour that's left. Okay. Okay, so real quick. So um, actually, let me skip this thing. I uh, will go back in. So First point that I want to get through to the audience is that these elections are at the village government level, and this is actually the very, very low level of administration, okay? In fact, if it's so low that it doesn't even count as an official level of the, of the state bureaucracy, okay? So the state bureaucracy, you have the central government, then you have the provinces, then you have prefectures, counties, townships, and then it stops. And the villages are below that, okay? Um, so, so again, this is like at the very, very, very low, local level, right? You know, with some painting with a broad brush, you can think of the village level as the successor of the work brigade after the collectivization in the late 70s, okay? And, and, the, and the government of the village is basically uh, headed by the village chief or village chairman, okay, which, which has the, um, the village committee, right? But as, again, you know, the Lenin structure of China also goes down to the village level. So you also will have the Communist Party cell, cell headed by the party secretary. Okay, so like everywhere in China, you have this dual leadership uh, situation, right? Now, these village governments are very low, as I said, in the bureaucratic level. They're actually still quite important for the life of the, of the people living in the village, right? Because actually for most villages, these are the only face of the state that are as, as, it, as it's present in the village, right? And these guys are responsible for a whole bunch of things, among them um, raising funds for local public goods. So think about, you know, paving the road from the village to the main road. That would be a responsibility of these guys, right? Or fixing the roof of the, of the local school would be a responsibility of these people. Right? Or plant, planting trees would be the responsibility of these people, right? digging ditches, so with this kind of public, uh, more than public goods thing about local public investment, these are the guys doing it, right? Um, they are also responsible for the land allocation. That's actually huge, right? So land is actually still kind of collectively owned in theory, right? After the collectivization. Um, but of course, after the collectivization, land was actually allocated to households in long-term contracts, right? That was the whole point of the collectivizing, right? And these are the guys actually making these allocations. So, you know, this is actually very important, right? Because your household is going to do very different if it gets a good plot of land versus a crappy plot of land, right? And also there are village enterprises and, and even private enterprises that if they want to use land, they have to get land allocated by these guys, okay? And then, of course, point number three is the important one. So um, when in Berlin, in Beijing, they say, you know, we have to have the one child policy, at the local level, it's actually these guys coordinating it and making it happen, okay? Of course, under supervision by the actual bureaucrats of the township and the county, right? But at the local guy, the guy that's gonna come knocking on your door and say, you know, I see too many children here is gonna be these people, okay? Uh, and same thing with land expropriations that happen sometimes that, you know, to take land away from the village, it's gonna be these people implementing all these unpopular policies, right? And frankly, more things that I didn't even last here. So these guys are supposed to keep order. So, you know, they're also quote unquote, the police, if you want. Um, they're also the first level of a dispute resolution would be these guys. Again, bottom line, they're basically the face of the state in these villages, right? Okay. Um, so what were the electoral reforms? Again, they happened in the mid 1980s. And what the reforms were, they introduced elections for the village chairman and the village committee positions, okay? So if you want one half of the village leadership, right? Because of course the communist party said you don't get elections in that, okay? And these elections were supposed to happen every three years. Initially, the party kind of nominates the candidates but very quickly we move to a world in which people self-nominate and as long as the party doesn't basically have any reason not to let you run, you basically, you get to run, right? So most, think about most of the world where people self-nominating among a set of people that the party finds acceptable, 
let's think, you know, think, think in terms of this, okay? There's a heterogeneity pattern. Now, an important thing to, to think about is the party secretary is not affected by the electoral reforms. And one thing that the reforms don't do is to clearly delineate the relative authority of the village chairman and the party secretary, right? They live basically as ambiguous as it was before, or as it's ever been basically, frankly, anywhere you go in China, there's this ambiguity between the executive people and the party people that are all supposed to be running things, right? Um, and then, you know, how was this introduced? It was staggered, actually, across villages. Um, mostly, the timing is actually driven mostly at the province level. So when provinces decide to move, then they give orders down. And then basically, at some point, counties decide to move. And then when the county moves, it implements elections basically in, in the villages that are under its control. Okay. And this target introduction is what we're going to use for identification. It's not very clean, but I'm going to try to convince you. Um, actually, I don't know that I'm going to have time about that. We, we run basically a whole bunch of robustness checks to try to convince you that timing shouldn't be too much of an issue. Right? OK, so. How are we going to go about um, about trying to substantiate those facts I was telling you about? Okay, so if you've tried to work on China, you will know that the farther back you go into the reform era, the harder it is to find data that is actually of any credibility. Especially the eighties are like a very foggy time. Um, uh, but the reason we actually got involved in this in this data in this project is because we found that there was this survey called the national the national fixed point survey. That it's run by a small research center inside the Ministry of Agriculture, right? And what these guys did is that they selected 200 odd villages in the in 1986, okay? And then they go there annually to to collect data, right? Now the nice thing about this survey, actually, two things are nice. The first one is that it tells very much the story. The existence of this survey actually tells the story already that we want to tell, which is that the reason the Ministry of Agriculture is running this survey from the 1980s is because the minister was sitting in, in Beijing and realized that he didn't know what the heck was going on in the county center, right? And he also knew that he couldn't really trust the data that was created by the, by the kind of the official data because that was extremely politically biased, right? So basically he set aside a little bit of money to run this survey and to have his own, you know, set of eyes about what's going on, what was going on in the county center. Right. So the nice thing about this is that, as far as we can tell, this data is used every year. It's, it's been collected every year. It's been basically summarized in a few graphs for the minister and like the high, you know, the, the, the high policy people in the Ministry of Agriculture, and then it basically sent to the basement to gather dust. Okay. Um, so anyway, so that's interesting. So what's good about the data? Again, it goes back in, all the way back to 1986. Point number one, which is nice. Point number two is that. Um, the, the data is actually quite rich in terms of economic things because that's what the Minister of Agriculture is, is interested in. But of course, the Minister of Agriculture couldn't care less about elections or electoral reform, so there was no data about quote unquote politics in this, you know, in this survey, right? So what we did is we're basically using the same people that yearly go to these villages with the National Fixed Point uh, Survey, basically we paired with the Minister of Agriculture and they allowed us to add a few pages to the survey that they run every year. Um, and these pages basically are, are basically, the surveyor goes into the village and would peer through the village records to get us data about when they run elections, um, um, basically all the political data, okay? It's basically think about it of getting basically record data about all the political stuff in the village, again, going back to the early eighties, okay? And the nice thing is that we're using the same system these guys use to collect data. So in a way, it's not intrusive. It's not like all of a sudden a bunch of white people show up in these villages and start asking questions about elections. Okay. So anyway, the bottom line is when you put everything together, we have basically uh, what I call the long data set, which is a panel of 217 villages, quite representative. It's basically almost all provinces except Tibet um, and Xinjiang. Actually, we have Xinjiang, so we have Tibet. Um, and, and this goes from 1986 to 2005, okay? That's kind of thing about merging the national pitch, fixed point data with our own data on elections, right? And then in 2019, literally last summer, so not this summer, but the previous one, they allowed us to run a very small one. Again, we can talk about how hard that was because the political environment has changed a lot in China, by the way, from, from the first time, the first data to now. 
And now basically we were able to reach 200 of those 217 villagers to ask them basically about the last decade and a half. Okay, and that's what we're gonna to use to talk about the recentralization process. Okay. Okay, so that, that's the data set. Okay, now another downside of the data set, I should speak about this, 200 villages is actually a really tiny number when you think about the size of China, right? Um, so, and, and when we asked about this, you know, the people in the ministry, they basically told us, we just had no money in 1980 to go to more than 200 villages. So that actually tells you, so this was really, um, um, it's kind of hard from today's standpoint to think about what China's situation was in the early 80s. We're talking about income per capita, basically that was lower to the average African country at that point, right? So it's, it's actually hard to, the country has changed a lot, let's say, okay? Okay. Now, um, one of the one of our uh, members of the audience, Nancy Lewis, asks if you have data on the candidates. I guess, uh, particularly respect to the diversity. You know, are they members of the Communist Party? I guess or not. So like again, since, since this data is from the records, so one thing we don't have, which I'd love to have, for instance, is things like the number of candidates. So we don't have that because they didn't record it officially. What they recorded is basically who won. We have the name. We have the age, we have the level of education of this person, and we have whether he or she, is actually mostly he, sorry, is a member of the Communist Party. And I'm gonna show you what I can about that. So, so some things we have, unfortunately others, you know, they never collected like things like number of candidates. Um, um, so hopefully that answers, I'll, I'll show you what I can if I have time about, about that. In fact, I have one table about that. Um, so this thing that you have here, this is the counties, of course, villages are not as big, right? So these are the counties where these villages are. Okay, it's kind of interesting that even to this point, the Ministry of Agriculture thinks of this survey as a, as a county survey as opposed, to, as opposed to a village survey, even though, frankly, they just pick one village at random for every county. So, you know, anyway. So that's, so that's basically, we, we cover the, the whole country with the exception, you can see basically the big, the big, um, the big missing area. Oops, that's not good. Let me get this out of the way. Uh, yeah, does it work? Yeah, the, the missing area you have it, you have it here in basically in Tibet. Okay. Okay, so what about the timing of the elections? Let me see that I don't lose people's faces here. So so first thing to say is by the end of our of the original sample, so to 2006, every village has received elections, right? So this is not, we're not going to be comparing villages with you know. So everybody will have elections, right? And when you look at the implementation uh, within province, it's actually very fast. So in particular, given our data, you see 60% of the villages, in a way, implement elections in a way within that is basically a three a three year window, right? So very you know kind of very quickly within within provinces, right? And then you have a somewhat long tail that we're going to have to think about what to do. Okay, so so you might have in a typical in the typical data that we have, you will have like I don't know, twelve villages per province, right? And th of those twelve, like eight or nine are gonna be are gonna get elections very quick, you know, in between three years of each other, and then the last two or three maybe they get staggered later. Okay, that's gonna be the typical structure of data within province. But of course, there's gonna be big difference in timing across provinces. Some provinces move early and others move late. Um, yeah, let, let me skip this. Okay, so um, now what I'm going to try to convince you is that we don't, be, because of what I told you, we don't need to um, be concerned too much about pro, about within province timing, right? Because they move very fast. And one way of trying to convince you is basically showing you this table. All I'm doing here, this this is a, this is a, a cross sectional regression in which I'm I'm correlating the year that people got elections. Right, the first elections, of course. I guess I should say the first thing to say is once a once a village gets elections, it's never taken away. Right, so you get elections and then you get elections forever. Right, so the real question is when do you get them? So here I'm correlating the year you get elections with you know characteristics of the village. Okay, and we, what you can see here basically is that there is um, kind of none of these characteristics that actually they include. Inequality, you see, include whether you are close to a city or not. They include basically uh, the baseline, you know, these last numbers here are going to be the baseline levels of the policies that we're going to be caring about, right, in terms of outcomes. None of these things are, are, um, are correlated with the year you get elections. 
with province fixed effects. Okay, so this is a cross-sectional regression with province fixed effects, right? If I take the province fixed effects away, I'm gonna see correlations, of course, because you know, for instance, inland provinces are very different from coastal provinces, right? And if they move at different time, I'm gonna see correlations. Okay, okay so Given you this, I'm gonna, I'm just, you know, I really wanna move on to show you tables, which is the full study, right? So um, I'm gonna, the table, what I'm gonna present you here is gonna be a really simple and I hope transparent specification, which is the one I'm showing you. So all I'm doing is running a different diff regression, okay? Where E is going to be, um, you know, a dummy, gosh, I don't know what a dummy for when does this work now? No, no, that's unfortunate. So I have this fancy pen, but somehow it's not much. So anyway, like hopefully you can see my the little the little cursor when I'm showing. Okay, so that's something. So this is going to simply be a step function that it's a dummy for you know the year you get elections, right? And then you know you have village fixed effects. You are going to have year fixed effects, and the only thing that we're adding here we're going to have linear province time trends. And that kind of matters because again, we're having the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. These are periods in which there's big diversions across provinces in China, right? Some are developing very fast, others are lagging behind. So that actually kind of helps. It helps in terms of soaking up variation, okay? Um, and then we're gonna stand, you know, we're gonna cluster the standard errors at the village level. And that's just basically, so when you think about the identification here, I'm comparing villages that have received elections with other villages that haven't received them yet. Right, for a given year, right? It's basically a classic um, div and div. And of course, the identification assumption here is that conditional on the controls, the timing of the first election is uncorrelated with other stuff that could affect the outcomes um, of interest, right? So, so kind of hopefully this is clear. And then basically what I'm gonna do, which I don't know, if I don't have time, I'm gonna like direct people to the paper, I'm going to try to deal with all these issues of potential endogeneity of the timing, frankly, with robustness checks, just either adding controls or adding basically clustering at different levels. Um, and even at some point moving at within province only variation, which is where we know that things were more random. Okay. But, but the, the regression we're going to mostly present are have basically this structure. Okay. So. Without further ado, let me start showing you the table because I think it's the cool stuff. Okay, so what is this first table? Okay, so again, I have to a preface of two minutes to tell you how we measure this. So as I told you, we are one thing that is always a concern in this context is what does this elected guy, the village chief, do in a world where you still have the party secretary looking over this guy's shoulder? Okay. So it's hard to know what the de facto power of the village chief. Right in this world where you have you know the party secretary uh, also hanging out, but one thing that we did is that we, um, out of a couple of focus groups, we figured out what were the what people consider were the most important policies that um, that these um, that these village governments decide every year, right? And then we collected data about who was signing the paperwork for that policy every year. Okay, the idea here is that so. And, and in fact, you have variation. You have, you have, uh, and you can look at the variation, by the way, in the first in the first column here, right? So say reimbursement. So this this policy of reimbursement is like research funds, right? So basically, somebody has done something on behalf of the village, and then he is supposed to get reimbursed, you know, from village funds. Who signs? The question we're asking is who signs this um, the little piece of paper that says, okay, so I'm giving so many yuan to this guy because of. So as you can see here is that when you put the village as the, all the data together, about 54% of the time, the village chief is signing this thing by himself, okay? About 23% of the time, the party secretary is signing this document by himself and the rest, the remainder, this 21%, we see both signatures actually in that specific document for that year, okay? So that's the way of it in this table, okay? And the, the four policies that we look at are basically reimbursement, public investment. Again, if we use village funds to fix the school roof, who is signing the papers of paper that says that this is so? Same thing, right? Here you see that the VC is only signing, you know, 17% of the time. And more often you have joint signing by the VC and the PS and the party secretary, okay? Same thing with the land reallocation uh, 
um, this is basically, as I told you, when you move land from household to household or you reallocate land uh, for different uses in the village, same thing, right? So again, about half the time is both of them together, but you know, here is like 30, almost 32% of the time is actually the VC doing that himself, okay? So bottom line, uh, and then finally, again, appointing managers of, uh, of collective enterprises, same thing, right? So, so all these things need to be said. So what's the, so what do I got, want to convince you uh, about the first column is that we actually see these DCs actually signing quite a few things by themselves, right? Or jointly. So it's, it's, this is, we're not in a world where the PS is doing everything by himself, right? That's basically what I want to show you in this first column. And then in the second column, we're actually running a regression in which we're asking the question, what's happening to this when elections are introduced? Okay. And what you can see here and the summary, basically the first, the, this first point, you know, the first panel A is we're simply adding up all these lines, right? To basically get a summary of this. So what you can see here is that actually when elections come, in fact, the power of the, of the village chief goes up and it goes up significantly, right? So, um, and, and what is this coming from? It's actually coming from the power of the, um, of the party secretary, okay? So what I want you to get out of this table is that at least as in our measure, which is the signature measure, we see A, that on average, these VCs are actually doing things all throughout the period. And that if anything, when the elections come in, they actually get to do more, okay? So that's, you know, it's not, causal evidence of anything directly, but it tells us that if we believe that the signature data actually reflects something, it's telling us that in fact, these, these uh, builder chiefs were doing things and they got to do more with the introduction of elections, right? These were not simply window dressing exercises, okay? Okay, so that's kind of first factoid, okay? Now, uh, going to the characteristics of these guys, did elections actually change anything about who these guys are? In fact, it did, right? So the village chairman, which is the guys that are elected, they become um, more educated, it's like 10% significant, and they become younger, okay? Um, but notice that none of these things are true for the party secretaries, which kind of makes sense. The party secretaries were not elected. These guys remain being the same people, okay? I should say that because maybe it wasn't clear, this village chairman structure was already there before elections, okay? It's just that these guys used to be appointed by the party secretary and they become to be elected. So that's why we can do this before and after, right? Now, one thing that you don't see much change, of course, is whether these guys are communist party members or not. In fact, not, not the average, right? About 80% of these guys were communist party members anyway, okay? So it's not like we're taking power literally away from the communist party. Think about these elections as being a very limited choice so it's, it's a choice among a actually a limited menu right you're still basically all these guys that you get to choose among are people that are uh, amenable to the communist party right but it's it's interesting to see that even this limited choice actually will create some effects which i'm going to show you now which is here in the main results right so what do i see that is happening in terms of policies when elections are introduced here is what i see Public good expenditures with money raised from the villagers, which is really what the, what these local officials are responsible for, they actually really shoot up when elections are introduced. Okay, this is basically column one. Right? Notice that, that the dependable variable mean is about 90,000 RMB, and the effect of election is 16,000 RMB. Right? You know, this seems quite crazy, but I'm going to basically these guys weren't doing anything before. There was. Our interpretation is that these local governments were literally doing nothing. And then with the introduction of elections, there was huge pent up demand for stuff and they do it all at once. And that's why you see these crazy spikes in public activity when elections come in, okay? You also see that actually these guys, when it comes to allocate land, they allocate a lot less land to enterprises and more land to the households, right? This is actually a big demand of villagers, um, frankly, because allocating land to villagers in most, to enterprise in most cases is very much associated with corruption and rent seeking by the local officials, okay? So a natural interpretation of this negative sign here is that, um, is that corruption, at least corruption that is observable to the villager is going down, okay? So that's so much for popular policies. What about unpopular policies? Okay, so we, I'm just going very fast because I'm running out of time, okay? So one thing you can also measure from the village records is the allocation of one child official exemptions to, to households, okay? 
And what we see here is that these guys, once they get elected, they get a lot more of these exemptions than the, than the previous guys. Okay, so clearly, um, so to think about, you know, 10% more often when the average was, you know, 0.5, right? So that's actually a big jump. And then finally, these guys are actually collaborating. Our interpretation of the column four is that they are collaborating a lot less with expropriation of the village land from, by, the, by the higher authorities, okay? So these really, these are direct orders from the township that they typically want to steal land from the villages for their own use. And clearly these elected guys must be collaborating a lot less because we see basically again these negative signs, right? So the overall picture here is, I see our popular policy is basically doing better in the sense of more public goods, less arguably corruption, but the, the vertically mandated policies like the one child policy exemptions or the appropriation are actually getting worse from the point of view of Beijing. Okay. I have a couple of placebo policies. Um, let's just say that we don't see much here. Let me not spend time discussing this. One thing, I, I think I have the graph here. So actually, I could show you. So column five, sorry, uh, column six is interesting because this is public expenditure in the village. But instead of being done with the resources from the villages, these basically transfers from above. Okay. And you can see here there's there's basically nothing, no effect. Okay. So in this graph, you can contrast basically the black line is public goods that are controlled from the village government. They really jump up with the arrival of elections. The blue line is public goods that are done with transfers from above. There's basically not much action. So that's the contrast. Okay. This is the typical, hopefully this graph is clear, right? I'm just basically putting. I'm moving all the timings to zero for when the video election shown, showing basically the year to year thing. Right? Hopefully, the black line, as you can see here, can also justify that crazy point estimate that we have, right? Basically, as far as we can see, these guys literally weren't doing anything before the arrival of elections, even though they were responsible for all these things. And then with the arrival of elections, they start, you know, you start seeing this spike in, um, in public investment at the village. Okay. Okay, I mean, we could, um, anyway, we have a whole bunch of robustness checks. Um, I'll, you know, since I literally have like five minutes, let me, I'll, I'll, let you, um, I'll let you peruse the table. It's actually a big fat table in the, in the paper if you want to, or, or we can talk about this in the Q&A, okay? Um, let me show you, again, I think you have two more tables to go through. Now, again, if we are right here, we should see that the village leaders that do more of the things that people want get elected more often, re-elected more often, and those that do more of what the villagers do not want, they get re-elected less often, right? And here is the table where they test that, right? We basically average the level of these policies in the three years of a mandate and ask the question when you, you know, if you've done more of this, did you get, did you get re-elected more often? So that's definitely the case for public good expenditures, you see? So people that, that do more public good expenditure get re-elected more often. I should put a stat in here, of course. The standard error is not clearly, it's not zero, right? It's just, you know, some number that comes through here. And that's also true for the one-child policy exemptions. Unfortunately, it's actually, it's not even 10% significant for column two and column four. So the signs go the right way, but uh, so bottom line, you know, this is one of those tables that is, you know, depending on whether you're a half, uh, uh, half class full, you know, half empty person, right? So we, we, we test four of them and we get two of them, the other two are um, frankly, the, you know, the, we, we don't get that. In my defense, I would say that both the land, leasing land to enterprises and expropriating villas land happens actually very seldom in the data. So once I'm starting to cut the data in so many times, there's very little variation, but anyway, just in the interest of transparency. Okay, so let me stop here for a second. So, so this is what I'm gonna show you for the introduction of elections, right? So what do I see? I see that the de facto power of these village guys goes up. They become, they are younger. So people are elected younger guys, more educated people, right? And these newly elected guys, they do more public goods expenditures. They do, um, they, they give less land to enterprises and more land to the people, but also they are, in, they are implementing, they're not implementing very often the one child policy and not collaborating with expropriations of land, right? So that's basically, um, the introduction of elections, right? Now, what happens in the second half of the data set, again, from the mid 2000s? So the first thing to show is that, as you can imagine, there's a big change in how much money the Chinese state is directing to the bureaucracy when you compare 1980 to 2005 or 2010, right? So the number of bureaucrats expands dramatically from one to seven million people. 
And the expenditure in the bureaucracy jumps spectacularly, right? Because not only it jumps, it, be, it almost doubles in terms of percentage of GDP, but this is GDP that has basically multiplied by, you know, orders of magnitude in these 30 years, right? So there's an expenditure on the bureaucracy has, has uh, dramatically. So then it's very natural to expect that bureaucratic capacity has increased a lot in China over the last 30 years, right? Now, if our, quarter, if our framework is right, we should see now the Chinese state actually giving less autonomy to these elected leaders and starting to do all the things more in the traditional top-down way now that they have a machine that works, right? So um, what do we observe? Well, what we observe is that de jure, elections remain in the books, and in fact, they keep happening, right? But the real power of these people is gonna be weakening. And in fact, they get more tightly over, overseen by the bureaucracy, okay? Um, so how, how am I gonna show you again? Well, basically almost all of time, I mean, we need to, so there's a few policies. So there's two things I'm gonna show you. First, I'm gonna show you what happens with the signature rights of these people, okay? And second, I'm gonna show you three data on three specific policies that the county levels, which are the county level right above, are using basically to, you know, control these local elected officials, right? The first policy is this gathering residence. So several places instituted a policy in which a county level official was going to the villages and hanging out there for three days a week to see what the local elected guy is doing, right? There's this second policy of Shanghai One, which is actually particularly bad. This is a policy by which the village doesn't even have any funds left. They're all controlled by the county. And when the village wants to do something, has to go and ask the county for permission to access the money that's actually in theory from the village. Okay. And then finally, there's this college graduate system in which think about an internship. So this college graduates that the system actually sends to the villages uh, for a period of about a year. And if they do well, then, you know, these guys are basically, um, as basically, uh, they have a head up into becoming members of the bureaucracy. Now, as you can imagine, these three things were never, these three things, the state never says that these things are to control these locally elected, elected leadership systems, right? All these things are built and promoted as technocratic support for these locally elected guys, right? But in practice, all this technocratic support is accountable to the county, right? So basically, this serves kind of both purposes. Let me go really quick to the table. Um, so what I'm, what, what I'm going to show you here is that there is a very specific correlation between fiscal resources at the county level, which is the bureaucratic level that supervises the villages, okay? and what's happening to the control of the village. But at the same time, clearly these frictions in control are gonna play a role because I'm gonna show you that for villages that are far away from the county seat, they still leave them quite a bit of autonomy. Okay, so the pattern that I'm gonna show you is gonna be in this table. So how to read this? Let's look at the first column. This first column is just the sum of unilateral signature rights that I was showing you um, a few tables before, okay? What I'm doing here is I'm running these unilateral rights on uh, the on the fiscal revenues of the county. Okay, this 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 um, variable gov, and on the interaction between the fiscal revenues of the county and the distance between the county seat and the village. Okay, and here because I'm, I'm in these first four columns I'm using the data all the way down to 1986. I'm interacting with post-2002, which is when this decentralization re happens, okay? So what do we see here? And down here, you can basically see the, the proper way of doing it, which is actually with the p-values, but anyway. What's the, what's the bottom line? Look at column one. What do I have here? As counties become richer, you see that the unilateral signature rights of the locally elected guys are going down, okay? That's the way of thinking about this first uh, coefficient here. However, this is happening way less so for villages that are farther away from the county seat. Okay? So that's one way of, that's the way of reading these first four columns. What about the, the last columns here? Here I'm asking what's the frequency of getting those policies put in place? So for instance, account oversight is this policy of actually having the account run by the county instead of being run in the village. Same thing, when the county becomes richer, it does it more often, okay, but not as often for villages that are far away. Okay, same thing with the gathering residents, right? So, although here, here I'm losing significant, but it's the same thing, right? So, 
for for as the country becomes richer, more often it has cadres that go to the village to see what the village leaders are doing, but not so often for villages far away. Okay. Okay, so let me, you know, I know oh, I'm actually out of time. So let, let me go straight. So basically, what's the bottom line here is that both county resources, which is basically our proxy for bureaucratic capacity at the county level, but also distances to the village matter. Okay. And the effects are substantial because one standard deviation increase in revenues reduces unilateral VC signature rights by more than half a standard deviation, right? So this actually, so, so heterogeneity across bureaucratic capacity at the local level matters a lot, but distance also matters a lot, right? So you have an increase of one standard deviation of, of distance reduces by, by point, by again, 40% of a standard deviation, this loss of local autonomy, okay? Bottom line, we think that this explains why elections have been weakened, but they haven't gotten rid of it. Why? Our explanation is that for villages that are distant, it's still optimal to have them a degree of autonomy because the county still doesn't know enough about what's going on there to run the village basically centrally. Okay, that's kind of our interpretation. Let me conclude here. Um, I'll just say one thing. So, you know, A, Two points to say. The first one is that this experience is not unique to China. It's actually, when you look at what happened in Indonesia under Suharto, you have the same process. Village elections at the beginning taken away later on as revenues in this case from oil come in and bureaucratic capacity increase in the village. And second one, uh, in, the, in the country. And second one, um, notice that this paints a very nuanced view about state capacity and democratization, in general, about this idea that you know as countries become richer, basically this this um, modernization hypothesis for democracy, right? There's this uh, there's this logic that comes basically mostly from political scientists that basically as countries become richer, people demand more democracy, and that's basically when we have basically just you know democratizations. But uh, another thing that happens at the same time as countries go richer is that bureaucratic capacity, you know, also increases, right? And in fact, that makes the life of the autocrat easier rather than harder, right? So maybe in the modern era, we're going to see basically the, the companies starting going the other way, basically. So this is one example of a country getting richer, the state capacity shooting through the roof, and as a consequence, recentralizing and becoming more autocratic rather than less, okay? Anybody you talk to in China would tell you, um, that in fact, particularly the 80s, were a time of a lot more openness, political and otherwise, than it's certainly now, right? There's clearly been a regression in terms of, op of political openness over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Let me conclude here, and I apologize, I know I'm basically five, six minutes longer than I, than I should have. Um, there's just a lot to cover, so. Happy to take questions. I know I've gone too fast, probably way too fast, so. There, thank you. Uh, actually, you're, um... Your connection was breaking up for me a little bit at the very end. I think uh, the message got through, but um, it was a bit of a problem with your audio. Um, Sezi and uh, and um, uh, Orkun had other uh, questions that look like comments more than anything else. Maybe um, I'll let them uh, I'll let them ask their questions, but we're really running out of time, so. Um, I think we should probably stop recording in a minute. Um, I'm going to remind you that Pamela Campa is talking to us in a couple of weeks. Uh, Nelson, Sezi, Okun, if you want to stick around, if you have time, we can maybe continue the discussion, uh, you know, informally, let's say. Uh, is that okay? I'm definitely happy to stay for another 15, 20 minutes. So very happy to take people's comments. Thank you. Um,